Welcome to How Gear Changed the Game, an exploration of the innovations in sports equipment and the role it has in the evolution of a sport. I'm your host, Alex Kendig Sherman, and we've been exploring the football helmet these past few episodes. And in our last two installments, we've been talking about this interesting transition that happens right around World War II. The Leatherhead era of helmets comes to an end and we move into plastics being used to create helmets and the face mask. After World War II, a baby boom occurs and there's also a boom in youth sports participation. And as you've learned in the past couple of episodes, there's also a change in the type of equipment being used for football. By the end of the 1940s, there's a mass transition across the game at all levels, from leather helmets to hard plastic headwear with hard metal face masks. The way players block and tackle changes during this era, from using the shoulders and arms to having no choice but to use the head. But during this transition, not all teams are created equal, and not all gear is the same quality. For teams, it's a matter of not just outplaying your opponent, but out-equipping them. Mismatches in gear is a factor. Bigger and stronger gear makes a player feel bigger and stronger. This era, when padding and sports gear innovation hits a boom from the 1950s through the 60s into the 70s, is one where common men become super athletes, and those born with super athlete traits become superheroes. And when that big strong gear gets put on trial, it's one of the superheroes of the NFL, O.J. Simpson, who shows up as a surprise witness in a big court trial that would end up changing the game. The players, the gear, and the game become larger than life in this episode of How Gear Changed the Game. A disclaimer before we venture into this episode. We're going to be touching on divisive things today. The safety of the game of football, and specifically head injury. There's no political agenda here, and I'm not trying to shape your opinion, or indict anyone, or do anything other than tell the story of the gear and its influence in the game. The goal in mentioning the court cases, injuries, concerns, and critics here today and in this episode is to simply tell the story of the football helmet. And this stuff that we're about to get into is part of that story. Nothing starts out perfect. You can design the perfect piece of gear with the most up-to-date materials, the best engineering to date, but human nature will always be a factor. New materials, innovations, guidelines will always be made for improvement, and hindsight will always be 2020. Okay, on with the show. When we left off last episode, the face mask had come into the picture and had become a mandatory thing. It had been around in the game forever and had been used in the game in the 30s and 40s to protect existing facial injuries. But once the plastic helmet comes along, it kind of forces League's hands to make it mandatory, even though the face mask wasn't perfect and opened up a whole new can of worms on the types of injuries that were happening while playing football. If you haven't heard the episode about the face mask or any of the other episodes, I really recommend you listen to those first because we're building upon knowledge we've already gained throughout the other episodes. And also, if you haven't yet, subscribe. Anyway, through the 1950s and into the 1960s, sports participation hits a boom. And as a result, the sporting goods business also has a huge boom. It's a race to best equip players for the battle-like contests on the field, much like how there was a military industry during World War II. While the military-industrial complex has its arms race, while well, the sporting goods industry has an arms race of its own. In 1961, President Dwight D. Eisenhower was serving the last year of his term. A few years prior, when he was the Supreme Allied Commander of the European Theater during World War II, he had benefited from a robust military industry. But in his farewell speech in 1961, he tried to warn us about the dangers of the military-industrial complex, even though it was against his best interests. A vital element in keeping the peace is our military establishment. Our arms must be mighty, ready for instant action, so that no potential aggressor may be tempted to risk his own destruction. Our military organization today bears little relation to that known of any of my predecessors in peacetime. 
or indeed by the fighting men of World War II or Korea. Until the latest of our world conflicts, the United States had no armaments industry. American makers of plowshares could, with time and as required, make swords as well. But we can no longer risk emergency improvisation of national defense. We have been compelled to create a permanent armaments industry of vast proportions. How to do this? Three and a half million men and women are directly engaged in the defense establishment. We annually spend on military security alone more than the net income of all United States corporations. Now, this conjunction of an immense military establishment and a large arms industry is new in the American experience. The total influence, economic, political, even spiritual, is felt in every city, every state house, every office of the federal government. We recognize the imperative need for this development, yet we must not fail to comprehend its grave implications. Our toil, resources, and livelihood are all involved. So is the very structure of our society. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. We should take nothing for granted. Only an alert and knowledgeable citizenry can compel the proper meshing of the huge industrial and military machinery of defense with our peaceful methods and goals, so that security and liberty may prosper together. To hear that from a guy who is directly tied to that industry should really speak to the magnitude of the warning he's trying to give us. It's a tricky catch-22. You want to be best prepared, have the most advanced and up-to-date weapons, so should conflict arise, we can be best prepared. But when there are people who make money when there is conflict, well, that's when the ethics get kind of murky. But here's the thing about the military-industrial complex that relates to what we're going to be talking about today. Yes, it is about protecting the nation and having the most advanced equipment to be able to do so. But when the business is creating things for protection, you have to constantly look at and keep an eye on what is the standard for those that are in the business of making weapons for war. And is the objective truly to protect the nation, or is it to just sell something that seems like it will? And how do we know for certain that when the moment arrives when it's really needed, it will be able to withstand the tests it will face. This warning was made in 1961, and it's an issue that is probably always going to be in the picture in some form or another. So what does this have to do with football? Well, let's draw the parallels. We can do it pretty easily. Eisenhower is talking about how plowshares used to make swords for themselves or guns for themselves, arm themselves to head off to battle. But then, as the wars got bigger, well, it became an industry all its own. And the football industry is the same way. It starts out with young players and college players making their own protection and their own padding, their own headgear on their own accord. But then sporting good manufacturers get involved. It becomes a big business. They evolve and change the design, come up with new designs, new materials, new synthetics as the industry gets bigger and they're able to crank out more and more of a product, sell it to more and more people. Not only does the sporting good industry get bigger and stronger, but so does the padding that they are building and selling. When the pads get bigger and bigger, it changes the conditions of the game. We've learned that over previous episodes, that there's a condition in the game, there's types of injuries that are happening, padding comes along and protection comes along that will protect you against those injuries, and once that padding and protection becomes commonplace, it changes the conditions of the game, and while certain types of injuries will go away, new types of injuries emerge. And when the padding during this era and the sporting goods industries create more and more robust things, bigger and stronger and harder things, it almost becomes an issue, like in the military-industrial complex, 
with mutually assured destruction. As a whole, I think you could sum up that the main concern with everyone in football is protecting the players and preserving the game. And so, even though there's divided camps on whether or not certain types of equipment should be banned, whether this should be brought in, whether this rule change should happen, everybody wants the same thing, and that's for players to be more protected. And when the debate comes up about banning the plastic helmet because of certain injuries that are coming along, well, in cases like the NCAA and their rules committee, they decide unanimously in 1949 to keep the plastic helmet and keep moving innovation forward. Not only is it an issue of protection, but for the sporting goods industry, it's an issue of getting in on this massive boom and this huge windfall of income that comes from creating this type of sporting goods gear. Just like Eisenhower said in his speech, it's the same at a player, coach, and parent perspective at a youth level in the game of football. You may be outmatched player to player and a team might be better than you, but if they have better equipment than you, well, that can be way more destructive to your team, to yourself, to your child. So as the amount of kids playing football grows exponentially, so does the demand for better and better equipment. And so in the game of football and the sporting goods companies that provide equipment for football, this was their big moment. And it creates an arms race within the game of football. Economist Richard Snyder published a study for the National Sporting Goods Association in 1969. He concluded that total sporting goods sales in the United States had more than doubled from 1958 to 1969. A boom so big, so impressive that he called it, quote, a vast, record-breaking human endeavor, end quote. And at this point, football was really ingrained in the American culture. Presidents themselves had even publicly supported and encouraged the game. You had Theodore Roosevelt, who loved the game so much that he stepped in and some sources say saved it. We covered that in our first episode. But even we just talked about Dwight D. Eisenhower. He himself said in 1967, quote, I believe that football, almost more than any other sport, tends to instill into men the feeling that victory comes through hard, almost slavish work, team play, self-confidence, and an enthusiasm that amounts to dedication, end quote. This is a guy who was also for a little bit there in, I think, 1912 was the star player at West Point Academy on their football team, John F. Kennedy who really didn't get to play that much football. He had a bad back his whole life. But he even posted several articles in Sports Illustrated. He wanted kids getting out there and getting active. And in fact, he even recruited Oklahoma's coach, Bud Wilkinson, to be an ambassador when it comes to kids getting fit and encouraging a well-shaped, well-informed, when it comes to health and nutrition, youth in America. So the movement was happening across multiple fronts when it comes to kids getting involved in sports. And the mass production and gear and the expansion of leagues all over the place made sports, especially football, much more accessible. So you have this feeling that needing to participate in youth sports, especially for young men, is not only a point of pride in the community, it almost feels like a civic duty. If even the presidents of the United States are calling for you to step up and not be soft and get out there and get active, you have parents that are encouraging it and they feel better about encouraging it because this football equipment is more advanced than ever. And we just heard the stat that not only that, but the sales of equipment has doubled from the end of the 1950s into the end of the 1960s. This rise in participation is a rise in sporting good demands, and that really gears up the sporting goods industrial complex. I'm going to read from a book called No Game for Boys to Play. It's written by Kathleen Bachinsky. Quote, Refining an older piece of football equipment, the helmet, proved much more challenging. No testing or design standards constrained what helmets could be sold to consumers at mid-century. Stephen Reed, a researcher and team physician at Northwestern University, pointed out that football helmets could be purchased anywhere from toy departments to sporting goods stores. Furthermore, quote, the headgear varies in quality from mere toys to the Cadillac class. The book goes on, quote, through the 1960s, the American Medical Association warned parents that helmets sold as toys could not withstand low impacts, were sharp enough to cause lacerations, and had internal padding that provided no protection on impact. 
The safety of children who wore such helmets were, quote, by the American Medical Association in serious jeopardy, end quote. The book goes on, quote, many schools, particularly those that served poor or marginalized communities, could not or chose not to invest the money in providing their students with the Cadillac class helmets. A 1955 study of expensive football equipment used in Texas high schools necessarily included schools willing to spend a tremendous amount of money on football equipment. Yet, smaller schools had smaller budgets and higher rates of shoulder injuries. The study's conclusion speculated that this might be due to schools, quote, economizing on items of equipment that were covered and unseen by the viewing public, end quote. Now, this book, No Game for Boys to Play, goes on to highlight one of these instances. Quote, Author Charles Trimble recalled of his school days at the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota in the late 1940s by saying, quote, Our uniforms were straight out of the Jim Thorpe era. Mothball, smelly, lightly padded, and outright dangerous to play in. We were ridiculed by the BIA, that's the Bureau of Indian Affairs, boarding school jocks, that we were the only team around that could fold up our helmets after the game and keep them in our back pockets, end quote. Imagine having a soft leather helmet that is able to just fold up and go in your back pocket after the game, and you're going against players that have hard shoulder pads and hard plastic helmets. And even if they don't have the hard plastic helmets, they have these gigantic, robust, fiber-reinforced, hard leather helmets that are a composite of multiple materials. It's a mismatch. Everybody wants to play better, but if you can go out and buy better equipment after you've been outmatched equipment to equipment, yeah, the demand is going to be there. During this era in the 1950s and 60s, there's a wide variety of different types of gear on the market from a wide variety of different types of manufacturers. But if you can get the best stuff, it makes a difference. This is an era where it is true that gear can create an advantage. It can affect the outcome of a game. In 1955, a Sports Illustrated article described the available equipment of the day in football as, quote, an unscientific patchwork of steel hard fibers and plastic which not only fails to protect the wearer, but has converted him into a human battering ram, end quote. So if everybody's playing like a human battering ram, well, not all helmets are created equal, especially during this time when you can buy something for five bucks at a department store that may or may not be a toy. And it goes against something that's definitely not a toy made by a company that's been doing it for years. Yeah, there's a bit of a mismatch there. And a lot of people don't want to be mismatched. Sometimes that's just the best they can afford. But for others, they want to get better, harder equipment if their opponent is getting better and harder equipment. You're going head to head here. You want to have the best thing possible. It is an arms race. For some companies in the sporting goods industry, it's just about getting in the game. Some of these lesser known companies that are selling their helmets in toy departments or just department stores. And then you have the Cadillac class who is in a race all their own. And they've been in this race for quite some time. And they keep trying to outdo one another as teams try to out equip one another. For the lesser known companies, it's not about how well the equipment is built, it's how well it seems like it's built. They have hard pads, these are hard plastic pads, it'll be fine, right? But for the Cadillac class, it goes far beyond that. And when they're trying to outdo one another while teams are trying to out-equip one another, well eventually, you're going to have to break through a hard ceiling. And for them and the helmet at this time, that hard ceiling is at the top of your head. Because whether it's a plastic helmet or a leather helmet, the interior design has basically stayed the same since the Zupke helmet of 1917. It's a webbed suspension design. That's what's absorbing the impact. It does okay, but if you want to be better, you got to get better. And that's where foam comes into the picture. Now in the military industrial complex, there's secret weapons being developed. But let's just say during this era that in the sporting goods industrial complex, there's secret materials. And once those materials see the light of day, everybody else tries to catch up or do their own thing. Or maybe they just so happen to be developing the same things at the same time. Now, foam had been around for a while in some form or another, but 
it's nothing like it is today. And there had been some kind of padding on top of a suspension system that existed in helmets, but nothing really solidified. Now, again, to draw parallels between military development and sporting good development, a lot of stuff in the military, napalm for instance, was developed in laboratories at universities thanks to funding. And now, sporting goods companies in the 50s and 60s were funding research at universities. The McGregor Company was funding research at the Cornell Aeronautical Laboratory, and it was headed up by a guy named Edward Dye. And he developed a new suspension system that was going to maybe help McGregor outdo their competition. It was labeled geodic suspension. It was a different type of strap suspension that allowed for the brunt of impact that came in from one section to evenly and equally distribute around the entire head. So it dissipated impact and and allowed players to take on harder hits and harder impacts. But to supplement this, he also put this extra strip of padding horizontally around the head. It went over the front of the head, over the temples, and around the back. And this strip of padding was made of something called insulite a flexible closed cell elastomeric foam that is very durable, but also a little softer than other closed cell foams. And McGregor was astounded by this great innovation. They thought it was wonderful, so they took it to the market, put it in the catalogs, and it didn't really sell. Players didn't like it. They thought it was uncomfortable. They thought it was a little bit heavy. So it wasn't necessarily back to the drawing board. McGregor thought that Edward Dye did some great work, that this was a great innovation, the suspension system, the foam, everything. So let's not scrap it. We just need to redesign it a little bit. So they did. And the new design that they came up with not only had geodic suspension, but also insulite foam padding throughout the entire interior of the helmet. This design would be a huge step forward for helmet innovation. But here's the thing. You got this new suspension and that's one thing, but all of that foam padding in there, it made the helmet really, really, really heavy. And with all that material packed in there, it made it just as expensive as it was heavy. So again, even though it was a big time innovation, it didn't sell well. But just because it didn't sell well doesn't mean that people did not take note of it especially the use of the insulite foam. Edward Dye wasn't the only genius at a university doing research about head protection when it comes to football players. Dr. Richard Snyder, a neurosurgeon at the University of Michigan, had been studying the injuries and deaths of football players in the 50s, and in 1961, he saw potential in this foam, insulite, to end a specific issue that was becoming far too common. Vertebrae fractures at the base of the neck caused by the leveraging of the face mask upward, which sent the back of the helmet into that vertebrae right at the base of the skull. Forgive me for being a little bit graphic, but in case you're not fully picturing it, just think about your head being the cap of a Coca-Cola bottle and the face mask being the bottle opener. Somebody pushes up on the face mask and... So he came up with this design on the helmet that would remove the plastic from that lower back of the helmet and replace it with that foam. That would also be a game changer that saved lives. And you can still see that design in some form or another on the backs of helmets to this day. The McGregor company is determined to make this foam padding design or at least the idea of it work. And they're trying it inside the helmet. And thanks to more research at Cornell, they decide to put padding on the exterior of the helmet. And in 1958, they release a helmet model that has exterior foam padding, padding on the outside of the helmet. And it actually gets used by a few teams, including Ohio State, Duke, BYU, Colgate, and a few others. However, it was really, really heavy. It's got that heavy foam padding, not just on the inside, but on the outside as well. So it was uncomfortable, it was heavy, and even though it did protect not only the player wearing it, but prevented unnecessary injuries to those on the receiving end, it had this issue of, you know, it's foam padding, it's not that slick, hard plastic. So even though it reduced impact injury, 
It did increase torque stress, because when contact is made, it grips and it can twist the head in ways that it shouldn't go. In spite of the improvement of helmets and sporting good companies doing all they can to make things better, parents are still concerned about the right type of helmet and the designs of helmets that their young boys are playing with on the field. According to the Journal Herald of Dayton, Ohio, on August 30, 1962, the Riddell Company was once again working with Uncle Sam for a helmet design. In 1941, the government had called on Riddell to help them design a helmet that could be fit for war, and that ended up being the helmet used in World War II in some form or another, and now it was the other way around. It was now Uncle Sam saying, help me help you, because kids were getting hurt, and maybe a better design of helmet? much like what the Air Force was wearing in 1962, could make the difference. A high school player in Dayton had died playing the game, and so helmet safety was brought to the forefront, coming up at school district meetings. A man in town named Donald Huxley, who was the head of the Air Force's Aeronautics Systems Division, specifically the uniform part and the helmets fall into that category of uniforms in the Air Force, he was at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, and he saw that the helmets he was in charge of that the Air Force was using were like football helmets, but had better padding inside. The article was written by Samuel Yeti, a Journal Herald staff writer, and it was titled, If Safer Helmet is Found, City Players Will Use It. Quote, in the safety committee's meeting Tuesday, Donald Huxley, chief of the clothing division at the Aeronautical System Division, and G.E. Morgan, vice president of the Riddell Company, maker of football helmets, agreed on a research plan to increase the safety factors in football headgear. Huxley said he is asking the three companies manufacturing the Air Force protective helmet to make new samples exactly as the protective helmet is constructed, but designed as football helmets. End quote. The article goes on, quote, Huxley said the present Air Force protective headgear is the safest yet for military purposes and is the result of research covering five evolutionary stages. The present suspension type football helmet is the fourth stage of that development. End quote. And the article talks about how the previous design of the Air Force helmet was a lot like the football design, but that the Air Force had moved on to a much more superior form of design and says, quote, Today's Air Force helmet, Huxley explained, is a hard shell with cellular-type foam liner that crushes slowly upon impact, slowing the movement of the head while minimizing the impact forces and distributing the shock. Huxley said the football helmet used today does all of these things, but, quote, to a lesser degree, end quote. Now, I just want to pinpoint this real quick so you can visualize it in your mind. This is all going down in Dayton, Ohio. That's where the child died. That's where the school district meetings of concern were about. And that's where Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, where Huxley is stationed, is located. Converting a helmet that pilots in jets in the Air Force use into a football helmet is no easy task. It's going to take a little bit. But progress does surface six years later. In 1968, the Associated Press circulated an article titled... Illinois fullback has $20,000 helmet. Here's some pieces of that article. Quote, University Illinois fullback Rich Johnson is wearing a $20,000 helmet in Illinois football games this fall. That's how much an investment in research and development Riddell Incorporated has in the experimental model air suspension helmets being tested by the Illini fullback. If the tests continue to be successful as they have to date, the majority of football teams in the nation may have the new type of helmet within a few years. The player says, quote, I sure can't fault it. It's a darn good helmet, and I'm really glad I got the opportunity to try it out. End quote. The article goes on to also quote the Illini equipment manager, Paul Shady, who says, quote, It makes our job easier because it's so easy to get a perfect fit. End quote. The article goes on, quote, The object of this enthusiasm is a headgear which has been described by one of its designers as a hydraulic helmet with a pneumatic lift. Additionally, the helmet has three separate suspension systems designed to blunt the effects of blows to the head and lessen the element of danger. Fitted inside a slightly enlarged standard hard plastic shell are 12 fluid cells, 12 pneumatic sails, and 10 
Fail-safe, crushable foam cells, designed as a safety factor should one of the plastic or air fluid cells break, end quote. And also covered in this article is how the helmet is probably not going to be on the market for at least a few more years. So one thing is now clear here, foam is the future. And the future can come at you pretty fast, and that's pretty much what's going to happen here. Look, we got this era of helmets coming at us pretty fast that goes from leather to plastic to suspension to different types of suspension and now foam models. Helmets are getting bigger, harder, stronger as the game becomes bigger itself and the game of sporting equipment and sporting goods becomes a huge cash cow in and of itself. But Let's put a pin in that for a minute because there's a parallel thing going on here that eventually does correlate with the development of sporting goods, equipment, and protecting of young players, different rules that are going to come along, different court cases that are going to enable some rules. Because as with any sport, the youth are inspired by their heroes and their role models, and those are the guys that are on the NFL field and in college ball as well. But as we're talking about the 1950s, 1960s, and into the 1970s, this was an era where not only was the gear becoming bigger and larger than ever, but the game itself and the NFL was reaching a level of fame that was absolutely incredible. Not only was the game becoming a household thing, but the players within the game were becoming nationwide celebrities on their own. This was an era when the NFL truly hit the forefront and became something that was larger than life. It's an era where brutality changes from what it used to be in the NFL, the typical slugfests, now with players becoming better protected during this boom, this arms race of equipment during the era. The brutality changes just a little bit. You could compare it to plowsharers making their own swords and weapons and heading off to fight brutal battles. And going on down the line, more generations, people are still going off to fight battles, but now they're doing it with industrialized weapons. Even though the battles are still just as brutal, they're different. This is definitely an era where gear becomes a factor on the field. And as making gear for the game becomes a bigger and bigger business, the gear is getting bigger and bigger, and it's getting more advanced, more industrialized. They're cranking out more gear than ever, and now we've got things like foam coming along. What standards are there really? Because at the youth level, when they're buying up all this gear, trying to be like the celebrities in the NFL they see on TV, they are kind of mimicking that style, and the style of play overall is changing. And how do we know for certain that the gear they're buying at the store is going to be able to withstand all of that punishing style of play? Well, that's the problem. There is no actual set standard. Helmets aren't tested before they hit the market because everybody is in a race to just get this bigger advanced stuff that the consumers might want to the market. Even in the space program, they sent a chimp to space before they sent a man. In football, you are the chimp, my friend. That's going to have to change, isn't it? The sporting goods industry and the game of football itself is about to get a gut check. And they're going to have to act quick to try and find certainty in a game where nothing is certain. That's all coming up next on How Gear Changed the Game. The NFL is getting more popular than ever, and the game of football is getting more popular than ever. We've gone over the stats, how the number of people participating in football from the end of the 1940s all the way to the 70s hits a giant spike, and how the sporting good companies are keeping up with that, and how much of a big business it becomes. Riddell and Rawlings and McGregor and Wilson, who are really in a race to... Not only outdo one another, but I think there really is a genuine effort here to not only reduce the types of head injuries that are happening, but to maybe be the first one to completely eliminate 
head injuries with their helmet. And that's no easy task, a task that is still going on in some form today. But it was a much different game back then. As we've already established, companies were working with researchers at universities, trying to come up with different types of physics and stress tests and different ways to go about the interior of the helmet, different composites that they could be using. Should we put padding on the outside, padding on the inside? Either way, the helmets were getting more protective And as we know, when it comes to any type of piece of gear, when a piece of gear allows you to do something more, do something better, well, that kind of introduces a change across the board as everything adapts. So when you have pieces of gear that were designed to better protect you, allow you to absorb bigger and stronger hits, well, you can also deliver bigger and stronger hits. So then across the board, all of the hits become bigger and stronger. Ah, but that means that the padding is going to have to get bigger and stronger to protect against these bigger and stronger hits, and it becomes a bit of a feedback loop. There's lots of injuries in the game, there's fatalities in the game, the critics go back and forth. Well, it's all this new padding, this new bigger, stronger padding that's causing the injuries because the players are playing a different way, while others say, no, we can't get rid of this new stuff, it's making the game safer, it's giving them more protection, we should keep getting more padding, and it just goes back and forth. As people want kind of the same outcome, they want players to be more protected and safer, they want to get rid of the fatalities, reduce the injuries. Nobody can really decide on the best way to go about it, because it's complicated. And regardless of what the debate is, parents are still enrolling their kids in football. High school football is still expanding and growing. And so instead of looking at the criticism right now, let's look at this through the eyes of the consumer for just a moment. It's the 50s or the 60s, and you've got this kid, you don't know if they're going to stick with football or not, and you know what your budget is and what your income is. And it's not just a handful of companies making this helmet that you need to get for your kid. You can get a helmet at a toy store. You can get a helmet at a department store. You can get them at all kinds of places from all kinds of different companies. And when you're looking at, say, a Sears plastic football helmet with Sears written across the front and could be bought at Sears for an MSRP price of $4.99, but you can find on sale for $2.99, well, you might jump at that instead of buying the Cadillac class helmet, like a Riddell, which will run you 15 20 up to $40. A lot of you listening have had frugal parents, and some of us now are frugal parents ourselves. And if you look back to that day, it's, yeah, you know what, this Sears helmet, it's hard plastic, it's foam-lined, it's got a face mask. It's basically the same thing as that more expensive Riddell helmet. But again, you're taking on that risk, risk people thought they knew what they were signing up for. Yeah, either the helmet's going to hold up or it's not, but I've heard stories of other helmets breaking, and this one is 5 bucks. He's 10 years old. Who cares? He's 15 years old. He'll be fine. If it breaks, we get another one. But how well is that $5 helmet going to hold up against the Cadillac class, as it's called in the papers at that time, like Riddell or McGregor, Wilson, Rawlings? Probably not too well. Maybe it does just fine. Well, thing is, Nobody really knows. The only thing that we have to go by is what it looks like, what you think it's going to be able to do, and what the advertising says. As big helmet manufacturers are experimenting with all different types of ways to add protection to the helmet, different suspension, foam on the inside, foam on the outside, harder plastic shell, composite shell, this new shape, that new shape, that new face guard, this helmet will enable you to smash through your opponent at any speed or whatever kind of promise they make. But here's the reality. There is no actual standard when it comes to football helmets in the 50s, in the 60s. The only testing, true testing, that gets done is on the field. We heard that article about the $20,000 helmet at the University of Illinois. That is the testing that it goes through. It plays in a game, and if it breaks, well, you can maybe write the manufacturer about it and be like, hey, I think there might be a defect, and maybe they'll work on it. But there is no tried and true standard. The only standard are the rules that say you need to have a plastic helmet with padding and it needs to have a face mask. Whether or not it could hold up, well, you just kind of had to hope it did. And that type of approach to safety isn't really a good one. I mean, if you're talking about a seatbelt and airbags in your car with a dealership and they say, 
yeah, this will probably keep you alive in an accident. Probably is not the word you want to hear when it comes to your health and safety or the health and safety of your kids. And probably when it comes to health and safety really just gives way to the word eventually. Eventually, bad things are going to happen. Now, we've already heard in this episode and previous episodes that the new types of helmets are bringing about a new type of play and a new type of injury. And eventually, these injuries are going to mount up. And as is the case with a lot of things in life, there is going to be one such instance that just happens to take hold of people's attention enough to institute some change or at least move things forward a little bit. And so one of those stories is one I want to share with you here. And it starts in 1967. On November 10th, 1967, Rio Linda High School was starting the second half of their game against Elk Grove High School. And Rio Linda was set to receive the kickoff for that second half. And the guy receiving the kickoff was Ernie Pelton. He caught the ball, started to carry it ahead, got 45 yards before he was tackled in what many described as a head-on collision. A hard hit, but a routine one, and so we move on. Ernie gets back up, gets to the huddle, and that's when his quarterback noticed things were a little bit different. Ernie was standing too far inside the huddle. He had his hands holding the sides of his helmet. He managed to make it to the sideline, but then he collapsed. Those steps that Ernie Pelton took from the tackle to the huddle to the sideline would be the last steps he'd ever take. His brain suffered such substantial damage that swelling occurred. Surgeons had to remove pieces of his skull to reduce the swelling, but that did not prevent him from becoming a quadriplegic. He would never play football again, never walk again. And so the question becomes, who's responsible? The players know what risk they're taking, and that was said in debates and back and forths. Was it the other player's responsibility, the tackler? What about that helmet that he was wearing? It says it's supposed to protect him against this very thing, yet here we are in this very exact scenario that we're all trying to prevent. Going through something like this is terrible for the family. It's not only an emotional burden, but it's a financial one. So lawsuits are filed. I mean, do you blame the school district, the player? But that helmet, again is something that gets brought up here, and that's why we're bringing it up, because the Pelton family files a lawsuit against the Rawlings Company, the company that manufactured the helmet that Ernie Pelton was wearing that day. In 1970 is when the Pelton's lawsuit against Rawlings really comes to a head. On day 33 of the trial, Rawlings unexpectedly calls a star witness to the stand, O.J. Simpson. Yeah, that's a guy that knows how to work a courtroom. Simpson had been wearing a Rollins HMD model helmet since his senior year of high school back in San Francisco, wore it while he was playing at USC, and was wearing that model with the Buffalo Bills. That's the same model that Ernie Pelton was wearing when he suffered his injury that this whole court case is about. So the lawyer brings this up, the lawyer for Rawlings, and talks about that helmet and says, quote, I'll take O.J. Simpson's word any time, end quote. I don't think that quote aged well. So, O.J. Simpson comes to the stand, and his presence, his surprise appearance, seemingly out of nowhere, coincidental maybe, showing up at this courtroom in Sacramento, well, you would think since Simpson wears a Rawlings helmet, works with the Rawlings company, that they were paying him to be there, they weren't, at least according to Simpson, who told reporters that he was there because he felt the very game of football itself was at stake in this trial. And so the cross-examination began. He was asked by attorneys, of all the helmets there are to pick, why don't you wear any of the other helmets that are in the market? And he replied by saying, all the other helmets don't fit his head that well because he has a funny-shaped head. The other helmets don't fit, but this one fits like a glove. And that wouldn't be the last time that O.J. Simpson would be talking about things that don't fit and gloves in a courtroom. But he did say about this Rawlings model of the helmet that it is, quote, the best helmet I've ever worn, the best helmet made, end quote. Man, he sure does like that helmet. It's a good thing Simpson decided on his own to come to the courtroom and give such a glowing endorsement. Anyway, the questioning went on. The attorney for the Peltons said, Do you really, O.J. Simpson, 
have any expertise in this area when it comes to science and the durability of a helmet. And he fired back, quote, no one knows more about a helmet than the man on the field who wears it, end quote. The Rawlings attorney had Simpson read the warning label that's inside the helmet that says, quote, some game impacts will exceed the capabilities of this helmet and you may suffer severe brain injury or death. Avoid all purposeful contact, whether blocking, tackling, or carrying the ball, end quote. That's an interesting sticker to have in a football helmet. You know the risks, yes, and we all know the risks, but to tell you to avoid purposeful contact, whether blocking, tackling, or carrying the ball, that's part of the game, and that's why you're wearing the helmet. So the attorney for Rawlings asked O.J. Simpson after he read that sticker, read that quote we just heard, do you do that? And he's talking about avoiding purposeful contact, and Simpson says, I try, but I haven't succeeded. And he goes on to say, A person would be pretty ignorant if he didn't know. I know every time I get on the field, there's a chance you can get hurt like the Pelton boy. The Pelton's attorney also brought up something we've talked about in a previous episode, about how plastic helmets changed blocking and tackling. Now players are using their head, and head blocking is now a common way of going about business on the field. Well, he brought up some evidence saying that maybe head blocking should be eliminated, to which Simpson said, quote, I'd score a thousand touchdowns, end quote. And again, Simpson concluded that that day he was only there because he believed in the helmet and because, quote, football is a great game, I'd do anything to help it, end quote. And yeah, sure, that's the thing, but this was an 89-day trial. Simpson shows up on day 33. A lot of other evidence was explored here. So would the arrival of this star player, a guy who's always been a star in California because he was a star high school player in San Francisco, he was a star running back, a Heisman Trophy winner at USC, was he a local celebrity in Sacramento? (laughs) Yeah, he was. But not everybody watches football, right? We got these jurors here. Surely they're not going to fall for this trick. They're not going to be wooed by some celebrity. They may not even be football fans. They may not even know who OJ Simpson is. Uh, Well, come on, you know by now that O.J. Simpson is really good at charming a jury into getting the verdict he wants. And in this case, in 1970, was the jury charmed by O.J. Simpson, a guy who was a national treasure for a while, a great football player, being groomed to be a broadcaster on TV, even a hilarious guy in the Naked Gun movies? Uh, Well, the jury, after O.J. Simpson appeared in court, sent a note to the judge asking if they could get his autograph. And in the local paper the next day, there was a picture of starstruck jurors lining up to get their autograph from O.J. Simpson. So yeah, you know how the court case turned out. They found a case in favor of Rawlings. The Peltons got nothing. And football lives on. After the death of Ernie Pelton in 2007, An article by Melody Gutierrez appeared in the Sacramento Bee. Ernie Pelton's mother, 82 at the time the article was written, was living in an assisted living home, and she was recalling that day that O.J. Simpson came in to give his testimony. She remembers the look on her husband's face, a look of defeat, when she said, quote, My husband told me we had it made until O.J. Simpson came in. That's when we knew we had lost, end quote. And just for some clarification, some sense of balance and fairness here, Simpson comes in on day 33 of that trial. And yes, the jury was starstruck. They did ask for autographs. It was a big media day when this star arrived. And the Pelton family did believe that this was a pivotal moment in the trial. But there were still 56 court days in the remainder of the trial. And the defense tried to prove the point that they believed Ernie was not hit with a head-to-head tackle. They tried to conclude that it was a hit to the jaw, which caused rotational forces, which forced a rotational injury, not one that was directly on top of the head. And their key piece of evidence was a broken chin strap. Well, what about the guy that made the tackle? Alan Sakauka, who had to give a deposition, He wasn't able to appear in court because he was being deployed to a skirmish in Vietnam. He said himself that it was a head-to-head tackle. But it seems the jury had already made up their mind. I have to say something that I'm kind of reluctant to say. 
But it's the truth. And I know sometimes with court cases, you can't handle the truth. But we have to point out the truth. And that is that Simpson was kind of right. The game of football was kind of at stake here in some way or another. Because you can't just keep having these injuries. In 1967 is when Ernie Pelton had this terrible injury, and he wasn't the only player in high school football in the country to have a terrible injury. They were fatalities. In 1968, there were 32 fatalities in the game of football. Something had to be done, and it wasn't just about the health of people that were at stake, but it was about the financial health. Because these lawsuits were going to keep on coming. Even though Rawlings had won, this cost them $500,000 in legal fees. That's almost $4 million today. And this wasn't the only court case like it. There were more popping up. Uh, it was becoming kind of a thing and was turning some heads for some influential people in the football world. But what this Pelton case specifically did, what O.J. Simpson unintentionally or maybe intentionally specifically did was raise the question among influential people how good are these helmets? Not just who is liable, but really, how good are they? And do we even have any kind of standard? And how can we solve this problem so that we don't have it again? Not just the injuries, but also the litigation. It's a game of contact, tackling, blocking, and players are using their heads. So that sticker in the helmet that says, avoid purposeful contact when it comes to tackling and blocking, how long is that going to hold up in court when the entire game is blocking and tackling and that helmet is meant for that game? So if these cases keep coming up, eventually these cases are going to start being won because it's going to seem like nothing is being done about it. Football was now face-to-face -face with an issue with their helmets. There needed to be standards, and it needed to happen fast. And that's just not easy to do. And a lot of people got involved. You had the American Standards Association. They were testing crash helmets, motorcycle helmets, especially after the death of a motorcycle racer named Peter Snell. And so now they were starting to look into football helmets. Then you had the American Society for Testing and Materials. They formed a committee called the F8 Committee and invited a bunch of people to come and join in this convention. Anybody involved with football, be it scientists, doctors, players, coaches, let's get together, figure out the deal with contact in this sport, the protection within the sport, and let's come up with a solution that we can act on. And they quickly found out during that conference that this is a gigantic and complicated issue that isn't going to be solved in just a simple conference. The chairman of that F8 committee, his name was Creighton Hale. He had been the vice president and director of research for Little League Baseball, now working to set a standard for all of this sports equipment. He summed up this 1969 convention, this meeting of the minds to try and find a solution, a standard, a better way of protection and sports equipment. It turns out, yeah, it wasn't as easy as they thought it would be. And his summation is, quote, Unfortunately, sufficient knowledge of human tolerance of impacts to the head is not available in a form that can be applied directly to the design of helmets, end quote. So yes, a complicated task for this F8 committee of ASTM. And the way that this committee is going to work, too, is there's going to be a lot of memberships. It's open, and anything that they kind of decide on needs to be voted on after a full process, a consensus. That's going to take some time. And with lawsuits mounting, well, the clock is running. And it's an amount of time that people like the NCAA and the NFHS, which is the big overall ruling thing for high school football, they don't think they have that kind of time. Football itself is at risk here, and we have to act quickly. So they did. And it wasn't just the court trial that started the formulation of this thing that they're about to piece together. It was also the fact that there were 32 players who died playing organized football in 1968. So the National Collegiate Athletic Association, the American College Health Association, the National Federation of State High School Associations, that's the NFHS, and the Sports Fitness Industry Association, as it's known now, but at the time it was known as the Sporting Good Manufacturers Association, all combined to formulate 
the National Operating Committee on Standards for Athletic Equipment, NOCSE, N-O-C-S-A-E. Their intent was exactly what the title implies, searching for standards when it comes to sporting goods equipment. And they were different from this F8 committee with ASTM in that there was no open membership. It was only going to be comprised of people from the NCAA, the NFHS, and the Sporting Good Manufacturers Association. So the oversight would be from the NCAA, the NFHS, and all of the funding would strictly come from the Sporting Good Manufacturers Association. That's the Sporting Good Manufacturers funding the group that is now in charge of their standards. Sports safety researcher Kenneth S. Clark later did say that Noxie was prompted by the determination that the ASTM's consensus process for developing standards would, quote, be too time-consuming to rely on for the earliest possible resolution, end quote. Noxie was officially brought into existence in 1970, and the announcement of the formation of Noxie was in the NCAA news within the same article that was announcing the jury decision of that Pelton case in which O.J. Simpson made that surprise appearance. Later in that same year, Noxe awarded its first research grant to the Department of Neurosurgery at Wayne State University in Detroit for a one-year study of football head impacts. It's kind of gross. They have had to figure out how to really test these things, even though Wayne State and their laboratory have been testing helmets since... According to one paper, the Tucson Herald that I read about this, they've been testing helmets at Wayne State University, motorcycle helmets, since 1943. But in the book Note Game for Boys to Play, it describes how they had to even use cadavers and even develop a synthetic head model to test these helmets on. And they were also using a, a tolerance curve for cerebral concussion that had been developed in 1966 by Charles Gadd of the General Motors Company. And Charles Gadd is actually kind of an unsung hero when it comes to American inventors. He also developed the Gadd Severity Index. He measured a lot of human tolerance for impact, especially when it comes to automobile accidents. Cars are a lot safer today because of the work that Charles Gadd did. For instance, the headrests that are in cars, they're there because of Charles Gadd. They're not there so you can rest your head on them. They're there to save your life in the instance of a rear-end impact. And that's just one of the many ways that he made cars safer. He also did work during World War II developing high-output engines for fighter planes. Like the P-51 may have never taken to the sky if not for Charles Gadd. And after he was working on the stuff in World War II, after he was working on stuff at General Motors, he even published medical journals and studies and invented a medical device that is used a lot in the medical world today, the remote-controlled catheter. When an artery is clogged and they need to put a stent in to save someone's life during something like a heart attack, they use an invention from Charles Gatt. So the guy contributed to winning World War II with all of the fighter planes and even work on the howitzer. He contributed to our safety when driving an automobile. He contributed to our safety in the hospital. And he also contributed to the safety within the game of football. So Noxy starts doing their research in 1970. By 1973, they released their first set of standards, and the first helmets meeting those standards hit the market. The biggest, most notable, maybe even first one, was the Riddell Helmets Pack 3 model, also known as the Microfit. It was a version of a helmet we've already heard about in this episode, and it was being researched back in 1968 at the University of Illinois, under that article headline we heard about called the $20,000 helmet. Yeah, this new helmet that they'd been researching meet the new Noxie standards. It was suspension, but it was also foam padding along with air-filled cells and rubber cells and fluid-filled cells. And a lot of these Cadillac-class helmet manufacturers would follow suit in having to meet these standards, except for the McGregor Company. We've heard about them. We heard about their research with padding and how they got us to a new level when it came to padding. Even explored putting padding on the outside of helmets, and they were working on their own designs. But as this new litigation minefield started to come about, the team of lawyers that worked with McGregor said, look, you're best served just to get out of the football helmet game altogether. 
So McGregor Company sold off their patents and designs and did discontinue their production of football helmets. But with the formation of Noxie and all the research that they were doing and now setting standards that had to be met, this led football helmets and safety and protection down a new path. Head protection had existed in football for a century at this point, but there had never been standards like this. There had never been research done quite like this. Up until this point, all of the development, the research, the design was all done based on the free market, of letting the consumer decide, of giving this illusion to the consumer that this is big, strong, it's padded, it's going to protect you better than the other guys. But now, now it had to have that sticker. It had to be approved. It had to meet a set of standards. For all leagues, there would be a transition period, but by the end of the 70s, all players in the NFL, the NCAA, and at the high school level would have to wear a helmet that had that Noxie sticker. And of course, there was a grandfathering period. An interesting story from this time is one from one of the legends of the game, Walter Payton. Payton, during his career, wore a Wilson helmet. But his helmet was interesting in design in that it was an old suspension-style helmet that had leather padding. Not the foam padding. Well, at some point during his career, Wilson discontinued that model. And it probably wasn't meeting Noxie's standards, but he was still allowed to use it, I guess because of that grandfathering in of old models and that he was in the league before certain standards. I don't know. But either way, the story is this, that he did have that old Wilson helmet model with the suspension with the leather. And once Wilson discontinued it, the Bears bought up all the remaining models because otherwise it was going to be hard to fix. So, Peyton, there's one story of him being, I think, at a pro ball and asking, because there were so many people around, asking a young person on the sideline that was working the sideline to keep an eye on his helmet for him. But one such story comes from HelmetHut.com, which is a great resource of some great stories and great information when it comes to helmets. They share a story of his helmet, just like all the other Bears helmets, going to a reconditioner during the offseason, just to get fixed up, cleaned up, and things like that. But his helmet was different than the rest and discontinued. So his helmet, along with the rest, ends up at Riddell All-American, the reconditioner for the Bears. And some fellow working that helmet reconditioning plant entered Walter Payton's helmet into the hot water helmet washing machine along with the other Bears helmets, which had the modern plastic cell interior padding. Well, that hot water completely shrunk and ruined the leather padding in one of the last remaining helmets the team had stockpiled for Walter Payton. Again, that was from HelmetHut.com. The rest of the league, though, were getting helmets that were bigger, stronger, and had different kinds of pads, one that would... Fit the head a little bit more snug if you could inflate some of the air-filled packets and some of the foam-filled packets would absorb impact. You had a little bit of suspension. And the fluid-filled packets I've found during this research, those were great in absorbing impact and deadening the impact, even though they were a little bit heavy. But the real subtractor of the benefit came in below freezing temperatures when the fluid-filled packs inside the helmet would freeze rock hard. But the helmet's would keep getting better and stronger and more strict in the designs and standards they were supposed to meet. Noxie didn't stop at 1973 with the releasing of those standards. They kept researching and they keep researching to this day, raising the bar on standards each and every time they come up with new conclusive evidence and new conclusive things based on the testing they're doing. And if you're in the game of football and hoping to be used, you have to meet that Noxie standard and you have to have that sticker on the helmet that says it can meet the standards that are set. And it's not just the different standards that have changed and expanded over the years when it comes to Noxie. It's also the membership and the stakeholders involved. Now, remember, it was just the Sporting Good Manufacturers Association and the NCAA, as well as the high school federation overseeing things. Now it is expanded and includes the National Athletic Trainers Association, the Athletic Equipment Managers Association, the American Football Coaches Association. There's also directors representing sports medicine and related scientific research fields, including the American College of Sports Medicine, the American College Health Association, the American Orthopedic Society for Sports Medicine, 
the American Academy of Pediatrics, and the American Medical Society for Sports Medicine. And they also have directors on Noxie representing the product manufacturing side of things with the Sports and Fitness Industry Association and the National Athletic Equipment Reconditioners Association. So Noxie continues to this day to expand and build on the knowledge that they are gathering. It was pieced together quickly as a result of fatalities in the game in 1968, of some litigation going on, including the Pelton case. And these days, they're trying to build upon more and more knowledge. And you've got to admit, the helmets that we see in the game are far more advanced as the standards keep getting higher and higher. So now the standards have been raised, more research is being done and the football equipment that is going to be reaching the football field from the start of the 1970s forward is going to be a lot more different, a lot more assured when it comes to protection than ever before. But it wasn't just equipment standards that was going to have to change during this time. Because also, while all of this stuff is going on, the NFL is quite the brutal game. It's becoming a more popular sport. It is a household thing. But also a household thing is the way that these players are punishing each other. And at their prime in the 70s, the two most famous teams in the league are the Raiders and the Steelers, two teams that are known for a brutal style of play. And a key part of that brutality is the way that players are using gear against one another, not just their own gears, but the gear of their victims. Yeah, the standards were good and the helmets were pretty protective, but some other rule changes were going to have to be set. And those rule changes come from the change in the standards and all of the stuff that we've just talked about, but also from a lot of other different things. And the combination of the standardization of equipment along with these rule changes is going to change the game of football in a significant way. What kind of rule changes? What would cause these kinds of rule changes? Yeah, that's in a moment on how gear changed the game. So as Noxie was setting new standards, at least at the college and high school level, when it came to safety and protection of the equipment used in the game, the NFL was having to set some new standards on their own. Look, football is a tough sport, and at the NFL level, it's the toughest of the tough, and it's always been a brutal game in some form or another, but there's this tug-of-war happening here with the game of football and with the NFL's rise to popularity. A lot of historians will say that the NFL really grew to a popular level and started to become America's game, sorry baseball, but it's kind of true, in 1958. There was this game that was played between the Colts and the Giants. You had Johnny Unitas with the Colts. You had this exciting Giants team with an offensive coordinator named Vince Lombardi, a defensive coordinator named Tom Landry. It was a great game that captivated America and made more people start watching the game, and it got more and more popular. Now, as we've been talking throughout all the episodes, from 1950s into the 60s into the 70s, the gear gets bigger, harder, and stronger. And while the NFL players have always figured out a way to play brutal against one another, when the gear is getting bigger and harder and stronger, well, yeah, you start using the gear to punish your opponents and start using it as armor to protect yourself. There were signature moves in the NFL, like the head slap, where guys were using gear to punish one another by slapping the side of a hard plastic helmet, usually around the ear hole, as hard as you could, and it would ring guys' bells. It would, it would disorient them. It would make their ears ring. Clotheslining was a big thing, and players, defensive players, would wear casts on their arms. Sometimes they would have hard plastic shims that they would wrap up around their wrists so that they could really effectively, brutally clothesline guys. You had necktie tackles. You had, even up until it was banned in 1962, ball carriers could be tackled by their face mask. Head hits were frowned upon, but rarely, if ever, called. 
NFL players back then were just a different breed. They were warriors. They were battlers. And I'm not taking anything away from any other NFL player from any other era, but these guys were just giant and brutal, and they wanted to punish their opponents each and every play. And because there were so little rules about the gear, they could do it with the gear. Fred Williamson played for the Chiefs in the late 60s, early 70s. He was nicknamed the Hammer because he had this hammer move that he would do with his forearm. One time, he did it so hard that he fractured his arm. And, you know, this type of stuff would be looked down upon today, but when he got a cast put on that arm where he did his hammer move, he wrote in big letters, the hammer across his cast, and the public ate it up. That's just the type of perception that it had back in the day. Deacon Jones, who was a defensive end for the Los Angeles Rams for 10 years of his 13-season career in the NFL, his name is actually David, he changed his name to Deacon because it sounded more, I don't know, threatening. He was nicknamed the Secretary of Defense. He was really good at that head slap move, so much so that an opposing lineman once sharpened the buckles on his helmet so that it would cut up Jones's hands and deter him from doing that head slap move. And... Jones's hand was cut up and bloodied, and he did not relent. Employing moves like this and other borderline plays, Jones was really, really good at his job. And he was one of those guys that wanted to punish his opponents. Another good example of that is the term, the sack. A sack is what you call it when you tackle a quarterback. Deacon Jones is credited with coming up with that term, sack, and he did it a lot. But why did he start calling it a sack? In a 1999 interview with the Los Angeles Times, he said, quote, You take all the offensive linemen and put them in a burlap bag, and then you take a baseball bat and beat on the bag. You're sacking them. You're bagging them. And that's what you're doing with the quarterback. End quote. Now, sacks weren't tracked as an official stat in the NFL until 1982, after Jones was already out of the league and into the Hall of Fame. And since it's been tracked as an official stat, the person with the most sacks in a season was Michael Strahan with 22. But somebody was nice enough to go through all of the footage and unofficially track all of the sacks that Deacon Jones made. And unofficially, according to the NFL's website, Jones had 26 sacks in his 1967 season and followed it up in 1968 in a 14-game schedule with 24 sacks. Dude was good. Dude was punishing. And a lot of other players were punishing during that time as well. And that's why a lot of players during this time, in this larger-than-life era where players were superheroes, they all had nicknames. Larger-than-life personas. George Atkinson was called Machine Gun. You had Deacon, the Secretary of Defense Jones. Mean Joe Green. Willie Contact Lanier. Some guy was just called Concrete. And it goes on and on and on. And these nicknames weren't just born out of nowhere. It was because of their brutal, punishing style of play. And as this goes about, like I said, there's a tug of war here with Pete Rozelle, commissioner of the NFL, and the NFL itself. Because they're rising in popularity. You want to be more accessible to more people, but there is this concern of violence. So you need to tamp down on that and make it more accessible to the family audience. And when people are tuning in and seeing a slugfest week after week, and maybe that's entertaining, but but eventually you're going to have to do something about it. Otherwise, people are going to see some really bad things happen on that TV in their living room. But also, if you're putting an emphasis on punishing players and slugging it out and this overall physicality, it sometimes, a lot of times, makes for a boring game especially when all the details of this brutality you can hardly see on TV. There's no instant replay yet, so you just have cameras up in the upper deck, and you can kind of see what's going on in the details and the way these guys are hitting one another, but overall, it's a running game. It's a brutal game. It's a punishing game. And so Pete Rozelle and the NFL not only want to clean up the game a little bit and figure out how to do that without changing the complexity of the game overall or bothering traditionalists, but also make the game more exciting, more fun to watch. Because after all, fans are tuning in to watch exciting football, not an exciting slugfest. So they started taking some measures in that regard. 
It started with things like opening up offense a little bit by passing certain rules. One of the rules came in 1974. It's called the Isaac Curtis rule after this guy named Isaac Curtis, a really, really fast, world-class fast receiver. And Don Shula and the Miami Dolphins realized, well, what if we just bump into him and hang on to him and drag him down the field so that he can't outrun our defenders? And so they started to do that, and they did it so effectively that it basically rendered Isaac Curtis useless. Well, the NFL passed a rule, that Isaac Curtis rule, saying that you could only make contact with the receiver one time once they were three yards beyond the line of scrimmage. Another thing that happened in 1974 involving gear is the goalposts. During this era that we've been talking about so far, that's the goalposts of the NFL still being at the front of the end zone. Yeah, right there on the goal line. Well, as you can imagine, having an obstruction right there where players are trying to run, not great. So this year in 1974, they moved the goalposts back to behind the end zone. Now, the main reason the NFL moved the goalposts wasn't because of players running into the posts at the goal line or the fact that sometimes quarterbacks trying to throw a ball out of the end zone would actually hit the goalpost and it would affect the outcome of the game. No, their reasoning was that they could be pushing the goalposts 10 yards further back and that would encourage teams to go for touchdowns more often instead of settling for field goals. A team in the 70s that had probably the biggest reputation for being the toughest, the meanest, the, hate to say it, but maybe dirtiest team to play against in the NFL was the Oakland Raiders. They had a full cast of brutal players, and they had standouts like Jack the Assassin Tatum and George Machine Gun Atkinson. Well... He is going to be part of some controversy that is going to lead to a lot of change in the NFL. Now, the Oakland Raiders, the team that Atkinson was on, had a reputation for being a really rough crew of guys. And so did the Pittsburgh Steelers. And those two did meet deep into the playoffs and it created an incredible rivalry and also one of the most ridiculous and revered plays in the history of the NFL, the Immaculate Reception. A play, mind you, that happened because of gear. Anyway, George Atkinson was one of those rough characters that was on the crew of rough characters on the Oakland Raiders. On the other side, you had the Pittsburgh Steelers, who were so notorious for their rough play that they had the nickname the Steel Curtain. They had guys like Mean Joe Green, Mel Blunt, all helmed by their coach Chuck Knoll. But it was what happened between George Atkinson and Lynn Swan that would create this change and a lot of controversy. In the AFC Championship game of 1975, the two rivals, the Oakland Raiders and the Pittsburgh Steelers, would go head-to-head -head yet again. And yet again, as is usually the case, Lynn Swan was going to be covered by George Atkinson. And at some point during that game, a pass goes right to Lynn Swan, and right behind him as he catches the ball, here comes Atkinson delivers a blow to the helmet, and then drags him to the ground by that helmet as it smashes into the hard turf. It would knock Lin Swan out. He would be stretchered away from the arena, and if the Super Bowl, which was Super Bowl X, was going to be held a week later instead of two weeks later, a lot of people speculate that Lin Swan would not have been able to play in that game. Swan, who hardly practiced with the team leading up to it and said in the papers he definitely wasn't 100%, was still getting dizzy spells, he did pretty good. He had one of the most acrobatic catches in Super Bowl history, and he not only helped his team win, he ensured the win with a third quarter with 3.02 left, 64-yard touchdown reception. He would get the MVP of Super Bowl X. The first game of the 1976 season, nothing was starting anew for the Steelers and the Raiders. In fact, the first game of the season for those two teams was against each other. And Atkinson was right back at it with Swan. And to be fair, we've already heard about George Atkinson. This is what he does. He's got these casts on his forearms. And if you look up highlight reels of George Atkinson, you can see the guy just throws forearms to the face mask, to the side of the head, wherever he gets a chance, even if the player is already out of bounds. Well, when it's Lynn Swan, and this guy is really good at making catches that pretty much no other receiver in the league would be able to catch, well, that just fires him up even more. And on a certain play on this first game of the season in 1976, Lynn Swan 
really catches the wrath of George Atkinson. It's away from the play. The pass isn't even coming to Atkinson, but yet George Atkinson delivers a forearm right to the back of the head of Lynn Swan. He was knocked unconscious. He didn't even see Atkinson coming. He didn't have a chance to brace for it. It was so far away from the play that the officials of the game didn't notice it either. There were no flags. There were no penalties. And again, it falls under this thing that was being talked about during the AFC Championship game of, well, that's the contact of the game. And there was criticism around that of, where do you draw the line between contact and assault? Well, the head coach of one of the toughest teams in the NFL, Chuck Knoll of the Pittsburgh Steelers, had had enough. After the game, he said that there is, quote, a criminal element, end quote, in the game today, and that guys like Atkinson don't even belong in the league. Clearly, he was furious, and who knows what he said behind closed doors, but we know how guys put on their PR persona for the press most of the time, most of the time. If he's saying this publicly, who knows what he said behind closed doors, but either way, the rivalry kicked up a notch, and now it was off the football field and into the papers. George Atkinson did not take kindly to being called a criminal element, especially considering that in 1975, Atkinson was in the papers for being in trouble, basically labeled a criminal as he was going to court for charges of embezzlement and larceny. Many suspect that Raiders owner Al Davis encouraged Atkinson to do what he did next because Atkinson was so upset about this attack on his character that he sued Chuck Knoll for defamation to the tune of $3 million. The trial took place just before training camp of the 1977 season, and it was a media circus and the type of attention toward the game that the NFL and Pete Rozelle, league commissioner, definitely did not want, but they were going to have to weather the storm. There was lots of finger-pointing, lots of blaming. These two teams were fiery competitors. You had... Two of what have been called the dirtiest teams in the league, but they were also some of the best performing teams in the league at that time. Were those teams dirty? Where do you draw the line between contact and assault? During my research, I even found an interview with the head coach of the Raiders, John Madden, from around that time, saying, quote, they want to say we're dirty. Yeah, 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 we're dirty. What are you going to do about it? End quote. That's just the way it was, and that was the attitude of the league, and, and the public ate this stuff up. Now, what about Madden's rival, Chuck Knoll of the Pittsburgh Steelers? He has to take the stand in this trial that's against him, and he's being sued for $3 million, and the lawyers are backing him into a corner, saying, well, if you're calling these guys dirty, look, you guys play the same way. Is your team dirty? Do you think you have some dirty players that are walking the line of being a criminal element with Mean Joe Green or Mel Blunt? And he has no choice but to basically agree with him. I mean, you're under oath. Well, one of Noel's best defenders, Mel Blunt, did not like that comment. And he was so furious with being lumped into those loathsome players that he turned around and sued his own coach for defamation for $5 million. And not only that... He said publicly, I'm not going to play for this coach again, and I am not coming back to play for this team in the 1977 season. Dang, a court case for damages is now damaging the Pittsburgh Steelers, breaking them up from the inside. And Mel Blunt would hold out and not play the preseason games with the Steelers. But wouldn't you know it, the Steelers and Blunt come to terms on a brand new contract, and he decides to drop that defamation lawsuit to the tune of $5 million. So Noel was off the hook for $5 million of the total $8 million in lawsuits he was facing. But how did the lawsuit between him and Atkinson work out? I mean, if you ask a lot of people while that was going on, it was kind of ridiculous in the first place. But one thing that you could really point to that didn't work in Atkinson's favor, again, this is a guy that is taking this issue to the court saying, this guy is ruining my public perception, and if he's labeling me a criminal, well, that makes me a lesser person in the eyes of the public and in the eyes of fans, which could be damaging to me and my career and my finances. But the jury sees him signing lots of autographs in the courtroom. Well, it's really hard to think that a guy's public persona has been damaged and that people think less of him if they're asking for autographs and he's sitting there signing them in a courtroom setting. So yeah, the jury did not rule in favor of Atkinson. 
and Noel was off the hook for that $3 million. Whew, good. And then, yeah, off the hook for that $5 million. But after all of this stuff went down, Pete Rozelle, commissioner of the NFL and the NFL itself, knew that they weren't necessarily off the hook. There was truth to what Chuck Knoll said. And, you know, these two teams were some of the most popular teams in the NFL and known for this rough style of play. But now you got guys getting hurt. You got court cases that are absolutely absurd and taking up the papers. Pete Rozelle, commissioner of the NFL and the NFL themselves, had to do something. First thing to do was to look in the mirror, which they spent the 1977 season doing. These guys were punishing each other, play after play. And, you know, it's tough players against tough players, very competitive guys, it's culture, it's all of these things. But for the sake of this show, these guys were using gear to punish one another. The Lynn Swan incident, you get a guy wearing casts that have plastic shims in them, delivering forearm shivers to guys' hard plastic helmets and their face masks, play after play. And it's not like Atkinson was the only one doing these types of plays. The NFL had reached a new type of brutal play that had never been seen or anticipated in the game before. And the bigger, harder, stronger pieces of gear in the game were part of the reason for that. And this is when that era comes to its peak, and then the rule changes that get handed down as a result bring this era of the NFL, and of football in general, to an end. The rule changes were coming. And during the 1977 season, some stuff must have stuck out because in 1978, there were a handful of rule changes that were made in the NFL that really changed the game. And one of them being what's known as the Mel Blunt rule. It's the 10-yard chuck rule, really, or revision of it. The 10-yard chuck rule prior to 1978 said that defenders could make plenty of contact with receivers within 10 yards of the line of scrimmage. And Mel Blunt really took advantage of this rule, and he would punish receivers within 10 yards of the line of scrimmage. Well, the NFL changed that rule going into the 1978 season and now reduced it to five yards. That's the Mel Blunt rule. You can only make contact with a receiver within five yards of the line of scrimmage. Otherwise, it's pass interference. Prior to this rule change, it was about bump and run defense, and bumping and running is how you cover receivers at the time. You just bump and run into them to try and slow them up, trip them up, and get them to a point where you could actually, as a defender, keep up with the receiver. Now, Blunt was so good at bump and run that not only is the rule change named after him, but a stat that really articulates how good he was at bumping up receivers, harassing them, preventing them from making the right play, in 1975... He caught 11 interceptions while doing that bump and run harassment to receivers. Another rule that comes into place is allowing offensive linemen to extend their hands. During this era that we've been talking about, there was a rule in place that told offensive linemen, you, you have to keep your hands tucked toward your chest. You can maybe chicken wing out your elbow, but you can't fully extend your arms. And so in a blocking situation, this really gives offensive linemen no other choice but to just charge forward with your helmet. Use the helmet and the face mask as a tool. But now that they're able to extend their arms, the blocking changes. It, the technique changes a little bit. It becomes a little bit more complex on top of buying the quarterback way more time and really solidifies the pocket. And the passing game in football had kind of come and gone, and it didn't catch on, and then it did catch on, and then the Chargers were starting to show more of a passing game in the early 70s, but then the NFL in 1972 moved the hash marks further away from the sidelines. So where the ball is being snapped, now there's more room for a running game to occur. So more teams took back to the ground. But now with these rule changes, the passing game was really going to take hold in the NFL because linemen were allowed to block by extending their arms so quarterbacks had more time in the pocket and receivers faced far less harassment as they made their way down the field trying to get open. That changed the complexion of the game and that brought us into the new era of football. In 1977, a receiver named Pearson led the league with 870 receiving yards. Four years later, in 1981, there were 15 different receivers in the NFL with over 1,000 receiving yards. That's how much of a difference it made. 
And while the passing game was becoming a new thing in a way that it hadn't before, it really arrived when Bill Walsh arrived in San Francisco. The 49ers started running something coined the West Coast Offense, and that was Joe Montana's passing game that truly entered the NFL into a new era. And it's not just the rule changes that lead the game of football down a new path and into a new era. It's those standards that we talked about with football and gear. They're doing now more research and finding out better ways to better protect people. New materials are coming along, new information is found, and new standards have to be met as the bar gets set higher and higher with the more that we learn about this gear. And so the helmet, as a result, has changed a lot over the years. I spoke with Las Vegas Raiders equipment manager Bob Romanski. He's been doing this since 1983 in that position, but he's actually been doing this since he was a kid. He's second-generation equipment manager in the NFL. His dad was the equipment manager for the Raiders, and so he was the exact person I wanted to talk to. He was very gracious with his time, and I asked him about how much helmets have changed since he first got into the job up until now. Here's what he said. The Rydells, um, before actually before the VSR four came out, there was um, it was called AF two and WD one uh, Rydell helmets, and a lot of those pads were interchangeable. There is A, B, C, and D sizes of all those things, so you could customize them, and it was pretty easy to do. I mean, that was that was pretty good the way that it worked. And this was way before the VSR four was uh, followed it because the VSR four was just a little bit of air and some cushions, you know, like air pillows kind of things around it. Yeah, so, I've read hard. some things about that. Like, didn't weather affect those things? Sure, they get hard as a rock. Yeah. In 1980, early 1980s, how many different types of helmets would be being used by a team on any given Sunday? Um, 80s, I would say pretty much Rydell's VSR4 was a heap of was majority of them. And then uh, Shutt had, uh, is it there? Pro Air 2 and Air Advantage. Those are the three helmets that were the most popular ones. And then for a long time, those were the only ones that were available. And then all of a sudden come along the uh, the revolution. And that's he, that came about about a year or so before. It was Jerry Rice wore it, um, like the second year it was made. I don't remember a year he retired or whatever. Uh, but Jerry Rice wore it, and that thing just blew up after that, that the new revolution. That was like the next – because nobody made changes on helmets much at all for years and years. Nothing changed. They changed a chin strap or they changed a front pad a little softer. But it was always the exact same thing for years and years. And then that Rydell put out that revolution. And then Adams, another helmet company, put out another helmet that was super light. Um, everybody liked And then all of a sudden after that, it was a war. Just who can get the best helmet out there, which is good. And the process of fitting a helmet today is a lot different than it used to be, right? The helmets now, they're, they're, um, they're scanned. Like John will sk- take a, he has a scanner and he scans a guy's head all the way around. And then he's, he's email that scan to write down and the helmet comes perfectly made for him. Back in the day, you used to adjust pads, adjust jaw pads, liners, up the crown pads. You'd adjust them to different heights and all that stuff to make it perfect for the guy. Well, now that's all been gone away now. That's just an excerpt from a really great interview I had with Bob Romanski and John Miranda of the Las Vegas Raiders equipment staff. I had originally interviewed them because I wanted some insight to a lot of the topics I was going to be covering in the episodes that you've heard so far. But throughout the interview, and especially after editing the interview, I realized this is just good on its own. There's a lot of interesting stuff in there, stuff that you guys out there may not know about what they do and just their overall mindset. Plus, these guys were really busy, and they were kind enough to make time for me. And also, they were just really cool, really kind, and I just had a good time talking with them. So our next episode is going to be an interview with Raiders equipment manager Bob Romanski, as well as one of the other equipment staff members, John Miranda. Both great folks. It's a great interview. So if you haven't yet, subscribe to the show so you know when that one gets released. It's a good one. So we've covered a lot of change in this episode. The need for helmets to not just be toys and to have a free-for-all when it comes to regulation. We needed some certainty when it came to protection, especially as we're watching a very brutal game on television. We need to know that the gear being used in the game is going to be able to hold up to that type of intensity. So we get 
Rule changes when it comes to the regulation of gear, and that starts a new evolution in the development of protection. There's rule changes on the field, which starts a new evolution in the way the game is played. And as you know, those two paths, they always intersect. That's how evolution works. A big change comes along into an ecosystem like a sport that is so disruptive that everything else has to adapt. And as those adaptations take place, change occurs. And change never stops, especially in sports, because the very basic part of the DNA of sports is being better. And so as you become better, changes need to happen. Improvements get made. And we've seen lots of improvement when it comes to the gear for the game. And as it improves, the complexion of the game changes. And uh, we've talked about a lot of other different changes within the game, but there's no denying that gear does have an influence in the change of a game. Thanks for listening to How Gear Changed the Game. It's a fun exploration of gear used to play the game and how it really did have an influence on the way the game is played and the way the game changed. It is not a definitive end-all be-all thing, and that is why I call it a curious exploration. We're exploring ideas, exploring moments, and sharing interesting stories of pivotal moments in sports and gear. And we still have here a big old pile of research of all kinds of interesting things that have gone on with the football helmet, the changes, the innovations, and how it has had a change on the game. But since football's going into an offseason, we're probably going to take a football offseason too. The show itself is still going to go on, but we've got other sports to explore, other pieces of gear to explore. So after the next episode, our interview with Bob Romanski, we're going to move on from football for a little bit and come back when the season comes back. Yeah, let's talk about some other gear, some other sports. There's a lot of interesting episodes coming up, so if you haven't yet, subscribe to the show. I've been your host, Alex Kendig Sherman. I'm also the executive producer, head writer, head researcher, and back patio sweeper of How Gear Changed the Game. If you want to send me some kind comments or maybe a suggestion for a future episode, future sport, you can send me an email at howgearchangethegame at gmail.com. More information always being added to our website. That's howgearchangethegame.com. <laughs>